So far we've discussed that it's not really a great idea to try to take advantage of, for example, this equilibrium to try to get the more substituted alkylated product out of alkylation of an enolate. And we looked at the malonic ester synthesis, which is an approach for synthesizing substituted carboxylic acids using a stabilized enolate, an alkylation of that stabilized enolate as the basis. In this video, we're going to look at a related method called the acetoacetic ester synthesis that is an approach for synthesizing substituted, highly substituted ketones. So we can make it look like we alkylated at the more substituted position. And in fact, we do this by taking advantage of the reactivity inherent in acetoacetic esters. So let's take a minute and compare the acetoacetic ester to the malonic ester that we've seen previously. The acetoacetic ester has an ester group, a CH2, and an acetyl group linked to that CH2. So the difference between this and a malonic ester is that the malonic ester had an alkoxy group here and had two ester groups, where the acetoacetic ester is what we call a beta keto ester. It has one ester group and a ketone group beta, alpha, beta, to the ester. So it's known as a beta keto ester. And just to drive this point home, so here's dimethyl malonate. Here's our sort of second methoxy group. In methyl acetoacetate, that methoxy group is a methyl. And so this is a ketone, not an ester. That doesn't actually have a huge impact on the outcome. Um, as we'll see, the same basic chemistry is in play as in the malonic ester synthesis. But the final product we, do, we get out is significantly different in that the final product is going to be a ketone rather than a carboxylic acid, and it's going to leave the acetyl group actually completely untouched, and that's the beauty of it. Now, like malonic esters or malonate esters, acetoacetic esters are readily deprotonated with alkoxide or hydroxide base. And this is because the additional withdrawn group connected to this CH2, we don't just have for example, the, the ester group, we've got the ester plus another ketone pulling on that carbon, uh, another carbonyl group pulling on that carbon. The pKa is way lower than a typical ester or ketone pKa. It's about 11 for uh, methyl acetoacetate. So this can be readily deprotonated using sodium methoxide. And this is a good opportunity now that we've seen both acetoacetic and malonic esters for me to mention what I like to call pKa biasing which is one way that we can drive alkylation and enolate formation to a position where we want it to be. It's really highlighted by the acetoacetic ester because this molecule has two alpha carbons that are both potentially acidic. This is an alpha carbon as well. But why don't we deprotonate there? And you may be tempted to do so, right? Because that may jump out at you as, oh, hey, that's a methyl carbon adjacent to a carbonyl group, or that's an acetyl group. And we've sort of been trained to zero in on acetyl groups. But that methyl group is much, much less acidic than the doubly alpha CH2 between the two electron withdrawing carbonyl groups. This is probably about 20. I actually don't know the number offhand, but something like that. This is way down at 11. So something like nine, 10 orders of magnitude more acidic between the two carbonyl groups than here. This creates a sort of pKa biasing effect where deprotonation is gonna happen exclusively there and not at all at this carbon. In the malonate ester, we don't really have a choice, but we can see based on the pKa that this is way more acidic than a plain vanilla, you know, alpha to a carbonyl sort of pKa, for example, a part of a ketone group. And that pKa biasing allows us to deprotonate strategically in a position where we want that to happen. Now, like we saw in the malonic ester synthesis, it's important to match the alkoxide to the alkoxy group of the ester. If we don't do that, transesterification is going to occur, and that's a nightmare. So if we're using a methoxy ester or a methyl ester, methyl acetoacetate, we need to use methoxide base. Ethyl acetoacetate, we need to use ethoxide base. The exact nature of this alkoxy group doesn't matter a ton because it's going to get hydrolyzed. Ultimately, we're going to see chemistry very similar to the malonic ester synthesis. And the first stage of the synthesis is just like in the malonic ester synthesis, SN2 alkylation at the activated position between the two carbonyl groups. And so if we treat the enolate generated via treatment with methoxide um, with Rx, a primary, got to be primary or methyl alkyl halide, we get a new carbon-carbon bond here in what is now a substituted acetoacetic ester. 
And we can repeat this process if desired to install two alkyl groups at that sort of doubly alpha carbon. And notice through both of these reactions, the methyl group is never touched. This is only a singly alpha position, if you like. It's only got one electron withdrawing group pulling on. So cool, we're now at a substituted acetoacetic ester. And again, where this chemistry really shines in what's, is in what's about to happen next. Just like the substituted malonate ester, it's possible with an acetoacetic ester to use acidic hydrolysis to cause cleavage of the alkoxy groups back to OH groups and decarboxylation of one of the resulting carboxylic acid groups. Here, there's, there's really only one, actually, so loss of the only carboxy group to give what is now a substituted ketone. And so just like in the malonic ester synthesis, treatment with aqueous acid and heat leads to first hydrolysis, notice the ester is converted to a, a carboxylic acid, followed by decarboxylation, loss of that carboxyl group. Um, essentially that carboxyl group is replaced with an H. Notice in the product we have two H's at the alpha carbon, whereas in this intermediate we have only one H. In essence, this H becomes one of the H's attached here. You can sort of think about it that way, although that's not how it works mechanistically. How it works mechanistically is exactly analogous to what we've already seen cyclic electron flow through a kind of internal E2 elimination generates the enol as well as CO2 derived from the carboxy group. I do want to pause here and point something out about the decarboxylation that is pretty important. One of the reasons this works is because CO2 is generated and at high enough temperatures even plain vanilla uh, carboxylic acids will lose CO2. That requires really, really, really high temperatures though. The reason this only requires relatively gentle heating, something like 40, 50, 60 degrees C, is because we're generating an enol product, which is a relatively stable leaving group, if you like, in the pantheon of carboxylic acids. If this was just a plain vanilla alkyl group, this decarboxylation process would be a lot more difficult. The fact that we have, for example, resonance delocalization inside the enol and stabilization of electrons, electron withdrawing oxygen, all that good stuff, makes this elimination process much easier for these beta carbonyl acids, these acids that have a carbonyl group in the beta position relative to the carboxyl group. So that's going on here. That's also going on in the malonic ester synthesis over here. It is critical that there be a carbonyl group beta to the carboxyl group that's undergoing decarboxylation. This essentially ensures that there's a stable leaving group left behind when CO2 is eliminated. All right, so notice here the product as well. In the malonic ester synthesis, this was an OH and we ended up a substituted carboxylic acid. In the acetoacetic ester synthesis, this is now a methyl group. So what it looks like we've done overall is alkylated acetone. And let me back up just really quickly. Notice this enol tautomerizes to the keto form of the, the ketone product, and this is what we actually isolate. This is the major product of the reaction. And what it looks like we've done through this deprotonate SN2 alkylation and then hydrolysis plus decarboxylation approach is the alkylation of acetone. And this is harder to do than it looks. You might think, well, we could just, um, you know, hit acetone with LDA and then uh, hit with an alkyl halide and we're good to go, but that could lead to the installation of two alkyl groups. We could get two alkyl groups on this side. That reaction is actually a little bit difficult to control, difficult to handle. And this is a time-honored and highly effective approach, and we can use it to very easily install two different R groups at the alpha carbon. Um, and so this enables highly substituted alpha, so alpha alkylated um, methyl ketones to be generated uh, through an approach that would be really hard to do with LDA or something like the sodium hydride thermodynamic enolate approach or something along those lines. So keep the acetoacetic ester synthesis in mind and note the analogy here between this approach and the malonic ester synthesis. Really the only difference is here we have a ketone where we had an ester group, where we had an ester group in the malonic ester synthesis.